Hi, thanks for watching BibleMountain.com. In this video, we're going to read from Exodus 4 and talk about how we're deceiving ourselves about the role of women in church. In recent decades, more and more churches are having women do things like read scripture, pray, lead worship, even preach. This is happening even though there are Bible verses that clearly prohibit women from doing those things in church. What we're going to see in Exodus 4 is that we need to take the Bible's restrictions on the role of women very seriously because Exodus 4 tells us that Moses failed to, to take one of God's commandments very seriously and it almost got him killed. And so the lesson to us is we need to take God's commands very seriously, including the restrictions on the role of women in church. Now we're going to start reading at Exodus 4 verse 18. Notice the words major break. In Biblical Hebrew, they did not use space to gather words into sections. They used letters. And the author of Exodus put a letter here to indicate a major break, indicating that when we start reading at verse 18, we're starting a new section. Now notice it says, then Moses departed. Obviously, Moses was departing from something. So let's go back and let's review the first couple chapters of Exodus so that we have some context for what we're going to read in Exodus 4. If we go to the book of Exodus and read chapter 1, Exodus 1 tells us the Israelites were in Egypt and they prospered, they began to multiply, they became very numerous, and the Egyptians turned them into slaves. Then chapter 2 tells us about the birth of Moses. Moses was an Israelite, but when Moses was very young, he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses grew up in Egypt as part of the Egyptian royal family. When Moses was an adult, he murdered an Egyptian, so Moses had to flee from Egypt, lest he be killed, and he fled to Midian. Exodus 3 tells us that uh, one day Moses was in the wilderness of Midian. He was tending his father-in-law's flock, and Moses saw a bush that was burning, but it didn't burn up. So Moses uh, turned aside to look at this bush. It turns out God was in the bush, and God and Moses had a long conversation, and God told Moses to leave Midian and go back to Egypt, lead the Israelites out of slavery, and back to the land of Canaan. Well, Moses didn't want to do that. Moses argued with God, but eventually God basically told Moses to go do what he was told to do. And that's where we're going to pick up reading uh, in chapter 4, verse 18. Moses is departing. It says, then Moses departed. Uh, Moses departed from this place where the burning bush was, and he set out to go do what God told him to do. So let's start reading at verse 18. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro his father-in-law and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren, the Israelites, who are in Egypt, and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now Yahweh said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Yahweh told Moses to leave Midian, go back to Egypt. And remember, Moses had grown up in Egypt, but he had to flee Egypt when he was an adult because he had killed an Egyptian. And Pharaoh tried to kill Moses because Moses had killed an Egyptian. Well, what God told Moses here was that Pharaoh and apparently the other men who wanted to kill Moses were now dead, which meant that it was safe for Moses to go back to Egypt. Verse 20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Yahweh said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the Israelites go. Now notice the word wonders. Another term that could be used here for wonders would be miracles or signs. and we read about this in a previous video in the beginning of Exodus 4. God gave Moses three wonders, three miracles that he was supposed to perform in front of Pharaoh to prove that God was speaking through him. The first one had to do with Moses' staff. He was supposed to take his staff, throw it on the ground, it would become a serpent. And then Moses would pick up the serpent by the tail and it would become a staff again. Uh, the second one had to do with Moses' hand. He was supposed to put his bosom into his hand and pull it out, and it would be leprous. Then he would put his hand into his bosom and pull it out again, and it would be clean. And then the third miracle, the third wonder, 
had to do with the Nile River. Moses was supposed to take some water from the Nile River, pour it on the ground, and it would become blood. And again, those were miracles that God gave Moses to perform in front of Pharaoh to prove that God was speaking through Moses. Now notice also the word harden, uh, and it says that God was going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and we'll read about that, and that did indeed happen. We'll read about that in future videos when we read in Exodus chapters 5 through 10. Verse 22, and again, this is God talking to Moses. Moses, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says Yahweh, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. Now, one of the difficulties sometimes of understanding the, old, the Bible, or particularly the Old Testament, is following the quotes within quotes within quotes. In this particular case, this first two lines is a quotation of what God was saying to Moses. Then this line here is the quotation of what Moses was supposed to say to Pharaoh. And then this last line was the message from God to Pharaoh that was supposed to be delivered by Moses. So it's a quote within a quote, within a quote. And that's why I indented these lines different widths to help uh, visually identify the different levels of quotes. Essentially, the message that God wanted to send to Pharaoh was, um, uh, God sent the message to Pharaoh that Israel is my son, my firstborn son. And God continued his message to Pharaoh. So I said to you, Pharaoh, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And notice there's a warning here. The message that God was communicating to Pharaoh through Moses was that if Pharaoh did not release Israel, then God was going to kill Pharaoh's firstborn son. And this happened, and we'll read about this in a future video when we read Exodus 12. Verse 24. Now remember, those previous verses was God speaking to Moses, and now we're back. It's telling us uh, what happened. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way to Egypt that Yahweh met Moses and sought to put Moses to death. Now this verse is a little jarring. Because God had told Moses to go back to Egypt and free the Israelites. Moses is on his way to Egypt, and now all of a sudden we read that God is trying to put Moses to death. Of course, the question is why? Well, let's keep reading, verse 25. Then Zipporah, Zipporah was Moses' wife. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet, and she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. Now notice the word foreskin. This tells us that Zipporah circumcised their son. Verse 26. So Yahweh let Moses alone. At that time, Moses' wife said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. And then notice there's a major break here, indicating the end of this section, and that's where we're going to stop reading in this video. So, Moses was on his way back to Egypt. Yahweh met Moses and tried to put Moses to death. Moses' wife circumcised their son, and then Yahweh left Moses alone. So the question is, what, is it, what was it about the circumcision that uh, at one point God wanted to kill Moses? Well, to understand that, we need to go back about 500 years, and we're going to go back and read from Genesis chapter 17. And this is God talking to Abraham. Abraham lived about 500 years before Moses, and Moses was a descendant of Abraham. So God said further to Abraham, Now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now notice the word covenant appears. And a covenant was a legal agreement. So this was a legal agreement between God and Abraham. But it wasn't restricted just to Abraham. Notice the word descendants comes up a couple times and also the word generations. This legal agreement not only applied between God and Abraham, but applied between God and Abraham's descendants the Israelites. Moses was a descendant of Abraham, so this covenant applied to Moses. And notice part of the covenant was every male was supposed to have been circumcised. And so this tells us the problem why God was trying to kill Moses. Moses had not circumcised his son, 
uh, which was a violation of this covenant, a violation of God's commandment. A couple of verses later, we read this, And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. But an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So again, notice the emphasis on the circumcision, uh, the emphasis that every male was supposed to be circumcised, and if they weren't circumcised, that, was, uh, that meant they had broken God's covenant. And so that was the problem, uh, why God was trying to put Moses to death, because Moses had not circumcised his son. When Zipporah circumcised their son, then God left Moses alone. Now, why didn't Moses circumcise his son? Well, the Bible doesn't really tell us. I can certainly imagine that Moses may have had a thought process, something like, well, you know, that covenant was 500 years ago, and it's a different time. And Moses might have said, well, it's a different place. You know, Abraham was back in the promised land uh, at Moses' uh, time. The Israelites were in Egypt, and Moses himself wasn't in the promised land nor with the Israelites. Uh, he was off in the wilderness of Midian all by himself. So Moses very, very well may have said, well, it's a different time and a different place, and maybe that covenant doesn't apply anymore. But obviously that covenant did apply. And we use those arguments today when we talk about the role of women in church. And to understand that, let's uh, look at some of the verses in the New Testament to talk about the role of women in church, and this is 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2 uh, contains instructions about church, and we read this in verse 11 and 12. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now notice the word quietly and remain quiet. This prohibits women from reading scripture uh, in church or in a church service, praying, singing solos, uh, preaching. Uh, all those activities do not fit the definition of remaining quiet. Let's look also at 1 Corinthians 14. This is verse 34 and 35. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. So again, notice the word keep silent, and notice the word improper. It's improper for women to speak in church. So again, this prohibits women from reading scripture, praying, singing solos, giving testimony, preaching, uh, any of those activities that would require women to be speaking publicly in a church service. Now, why don't we obey this? Well, as I said earlier, we use a lot of the same arguments that perhaps Moses used. We say things like, well, it's a different time. You know, these commandments were given 2,000 years ago. You know, that was a long time ago. It's a different time. We also say it's a different place. You know, this was given in the Middle, in the middle East. We don't live in the Middle East. Uh, it's a different culture. And, you know, we have our excuses that we use, but they're just that. They are excuses. And Moses had his reasons and his excuses. And we see that when Moses uh, didn't obey God's commandment, he almost got himself killed. And the lesson to us is we need to take these commands very seriously because God expects his commandments to be taken seriously. Now, if you doubt that last part, let's also look at a few verses that talk about discipline. And this is Hebrews 12, verse 9 and 10. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but God disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. Notice the word discipline occurs a couple times and it states very clearly that God disciplines us. And again, this is the book of Hebrews. This was written as part of the church age to the church. So this certainly applies to us and tells us very clearly that God disciplines us. Let's look also at Revelation 3 and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline Therefore, be zealous and repent. And so again, it tells us very clearly uh, that Jesus disciplines those who don't obey him. Now, there's another reason that, uh, getting back to the role of women in church, there's another reason that we uh, don't obey those restrictions and don't want to obey these restrictions. And it has to do with this. 
When you start talking that women should not be participating in church services, they should not be speaking, most women are going to hear that and say, well, that's not fair. And that's true. It isn't fair. But God never promised that things would be fair. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that life is not fair. And so the fact of whether or not it's fair really isn't the point. The point is God gave the commands and it is our duty to obey him. Here's another way to think about this. Think about who it is that gave the commands to women to be quiet in church. It's God himself. What did God do? God took human form. He came to earth as a man named Jesus, and he died on the cross. He was crucified. The pain and agony that he went through on the cross is far greater than any pain or agony that any woman will ever experience by being quiet in church. And the point is, what God did for us is far greater, uh, is, is a much bigger sacrifice, is much more difficult that when, than what God is asking women to do when they go to church. So let's review what we saw. Uh, first, we looked at Abraham. We saw that God made a covenant with Abraham, and part of that covenant was Abraham's descendants were supposed to be circumcised. Then we saw that Moses, for whatever reason, did not circumcise his son, and it almost got Moses killed. And the lesson to us is we need to take God's commandments very seriously. And then we looked at some verses that talk about the role of women in church, and we see that there are restrictions on the role of women in church, and women are supposed to have a very restricted role in church, and essentially are supposed to be quiet and not be speaking. And just as Moses should have taken God's commandments about circumcision very seriously, so too in our culture, we need to take God's commandments about church, we need to take God's commandments about the role of women in church very seriously. Thanks for watching BibleMountain.com. Bible Mountain exists to develop biblically literate Christians because the Bible is from God and each one of us is accountable to God for knowing and following the Bible. It is in our best interest to learn as much about the Bible as we possibly can. If you'd like to increase your biblical literacy, please join my email list so you can receive future videos via email for free. There are links on this video screen to take you to a sign-up page, or you can go to BibleMountain.com and click on Follow. This is a free subscription, and your email address will not be sold nor given away. Also, please use the share buttons on your webpage to like this video and share it with your friends. And once again, thank you for watching BibleMountain.com.